Hey everyone, this is Martin. I'm the Hungarian ambassador of Oppo and I am back with another video, this time around about the camera capabilities of the Oppo M3, the phone that I just referred to as the ultimate selfie camera phone. So I am actually filming this very first shot with the Oppo M3 in the vlog style scenario so you can see how well that works. And also I have my lovely friend joining us today. I guess it will be a relief for both you guys and for me that we will be taking a closer look at her face instead of mine. In any case, I also have a full review of the device coming up soon, so if you are interested in the Oppo M3, subscribe to my channel and let's get to the camera. So who is this phone for? Just by looking at the official ads, it should be clear that this phone is aimed at the selfie lovers. So how does it perform and also should you consider it if you aren't into selfies? Let's get the specs out of the way first. The camera has a 16 megapixel Omnivision sensor, optics from Schneider, an f2.2 aperture, a dual LED dual tone flash, and most importantly, it rotates, either manually or through the tiny built-in electrical motor. Apart from maybe the lack of optical image stabilization, the hardware sounds great then. But how's the software? Thankfully, taking photos, videos, and accessing your gallery are exactly one tap away, which really should be the only camera interface design allowed on any smartphone, period. You can also get into more advanced settings, set the flash, and flip the camera around by just a tap, though for moving the camera you could also slide your finger up or down the screen. A quick swipe will result in a total flip, while a slow swipe will end up rotating your camera, you've guessed it, slowly. Perfect for those moments when you want to become a stalker and frame someone in a picture on, let's say, a subway without getting noticed. There are also boatloads of shooting modes on the phone, some of them a bit silly, but others quite useful actually. But let's start with the main star of the show, beautification. If you're not interested in the selfie game, skip the video to this time to see my thoughts on, you know, all the other functions. I have those covered in full detail too, of course. But if selfies are your thing, this is where my beautiful friend comes into play to help me out with some shots. The cool thing about beautification is that it applies filters and other enhancements to your face in real time, giving you much better control over the outcome than with traditional filters, say. You can of course shoot without beautification or choose one of the eight filters which are natural, Japanese, because Japanese love white skin apparently, shallow memory, which by the way is an entertainingly terrible name, Valencia, expert, desert, rainbow, and mono, also known to old school people like me just as black and white. From what I can see, face detection is a play here and it only applies the skin smoothening stuff to your face and not the background or your eyes, for example, which stays sharp. As stupid as I feel praising beautification software, it's pretty well executed, actually. As you can see from the black bars, there's only 4x3 aspect ratios, but then again, nobody uploads 16x9 or widescreen selfies to social media anyway, unless I'm terribly wrong, of course. Also to note here is that in dark scenarios, the flash will be quite useful since there are two LEDs which either fire off separately or together. One of them is softer and ideal for small distances like a selfie when a bit of light is enough. And flashing both will be ideal if your goal is blinding yourself for a week. Seriously, don't, don't do that. It's so strong it hurts. Overall, the camera is without a doubt ideal for making pictures of yourself. Enough of the selfies though. Let's go through all the other modes. In normal mode, you'll have all things set to auto and you can shoot either 16 megapixel photos in 4x3 or 10 megapixel ones in 16x9. Long pressing on a screen will lock focus and exposure, which is great if you don't want it to constantly adjust itself. As we have come to expect from modern flagships, picture quality is of course great in bright situations with lots of detail and mostly accurate colors. With all the resolution to play, zooming in on details works very well and you can shoot objects from very far away. Most pictures have fairly accurate white balance, but occasionally, especially under strong yellow light, like the rising sun for example, I did get pictures which were way oversaturated. Take these pictures for example, which were taken from the exact same spot under the exact same light conditions, and only with the difference of being zoomed in and out. This is rather the exception than the norm, and I personally prefer oversaturated colors to occasionally dull ones, but it is something to keep in mind. Dynamic range is decent, but not exceptional, so you will get blown out spots like the sky here occasionally, but again, that's far from being bad either. If you want a little more control over your pictures, there is now a so-called expert mode, which I am super excited to see. Sadly, it only applies to pictures and not video, but you can manually set 
ISO, exposure compensation, white balance, and even focus in this mode, something I've wanted for ages. There's also this clever mechanism which lets you quickly adjust focus and exposure compensation separately. That's all awesome news if you wanted to have more control over your pictures, and it all works very well in practice. Ultra HD takes multiple shots and combines them to one 32 megapixel one, not 50 megapixels as on the Find 7, but the result is actually similar. You get slightly more detail and a lot more zoomability, yes I think I just made that word up, in exchange for some delay due to processing and an image that's twice as big as a normal shot. It can be useful for those times when you really need the extra detail, but I mostly just can't be bothered to turn it on. HDR is present, but it really isn't too good at all, and also takes way too long to process. Photographs in low light, on the other hand, are actually surprisingly good. Even pictures in auto mode turn out just fine, but really good pictures can be shot using expert mode and a tripod. Set your ISO low, and you can get rid of nearly all the noise and have fantastic night shots, which look great even when completely zoomed in. Looks awesome. Auto Panorama uses the electrical motor to make really high quality panorama pictures, and as long as you can keep the phone really stable, the results are phenomenal. Take this shot for example. I took it without a tripod by just resting the phone on the handrail and got a 180 degree panorama picture with no visible stitching at all. Also notice how on the left of the picture I'm photographing directly against the sun and while the sun itself is definitely blown out, the camera handled the different brightness levels surprisingly well. Very impressive stuff. Super Macro lets you take very close up pictures of stuff from far away while still giving you a full sized 60 megapixel picture. It's a nice trick if you need to get close to something and want a bit of extra detail. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, but you can also take animated GIFs or GIFs with the camera, which can be a lot of fun. Less fun but more professional is the ability to shoot in RAW, something I personally rarely do, but others may enjoy a lot. After Focus gives you a Lytro-like ability to adjust the focus of the picture after it has been taken, and Double Exposure lets you blend two pictures together. I I can't imagine how exactly someone came up with this idea, but it's here. Sadly missing from the photographic capabilities of the N3 is my absolute favorite feature of previous Oppo phones, namely slow shutter. I really hope it will be reintroduced in later updates, especially since even the not so camera centric R5 has it, but for now we will have to live without it. Video recording has not been very impressive so far. 1080p at 30 frames per second is the most this camera can do for now, so there is no 4K or 60 frame per second options. Again, I hope this is due to the software being an early build, but it is definitely missing for now. Anyway, the video quality is, I guess, average at 1080p and so is the sound quality. Videos with enough light will turn out just fine, but the lack of optical image stabilization will definitely show when you take videos while walking for example, and continuous autofocus is not present either. Overall then, you shouldn't buy this phone if you're looking for the most amazing back facing camera for video recording. But if things like vlogging are something you do often, then the N3 will still do better than practically any other front facing camera you can find on other smartphones. Finally, there's also an option for slow motion video capture using 1080p resolution and 120 frames per second. It works pretty well and can be fun to play with. My impression of the camera overall is that it's first and foremost great for selfies and making videos of yourself, which really is what this phone was designed for. It performs well with other photos too, both in auto mode and with manual settings, while the other shooting modes like Ultra HD, Super Macro and Auto Panorama actually make the camera quite a lot of fun to use. I now only hope that Oppo can improve video quality at 4K recording and reintroduce slow shutter again. If those things happen, this camera will go from being very good to being great in my opinion. So that was it for this video, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also follow me on my social media channels such as Google+, which is in English, and Facebook, which is in Hungarian. See you guys in the next video and thank you for following. Bye bye.